to call to order the Human Resources Appointments and Equity Committee. Today is Ju Tuesday, June 19th. Happy Juneteenth Day. Council Clerk, will you please call the roll? Calling the roll, Ms. Brown? Here. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones is absent at the he's moment. He's walking through the door. Oh, he's here. Sorry. Mr. Jones is present. Mr. Miller? Here. Ms. Conwell? Here. We have a quorum. Excellent. Do we have any public comment? No, no one has signed in. All right. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the June 5th meeting. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and second. If there are no questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Council Clerk, will you read the first item into the record? Resolution number 2018-0123, confirming the county executive's appointment and reappointment of various individuals to serve on the Cuyahoga Arts and Culture Board of Trustees for an unexpired term ending 3-31-2021. All right, thank you. If there is anyone here to speak to this um, appointment from the administrative side, if not, I will um, respectfully ask if uh, Ms. Jill Paulson will come up and um, maybe give us a little bit of background with regards to the Cuyahoga Arts and Culture Board of Trustees, if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. Good. Okay. I'll be brief here before I turn it over to your process to look at two of our pending board appointments. As I mentioned, my name is Jill Paulson. I've been at CAC for seven and a half years. I'm currently serving as the interim executive director and really excited about the great work that we're doing as an agency to support all of the cultural organizations in our community over 250 this year through grants of over uh, 12 and a half, 13 million dollars. Um, I think if that works for you, is there any other questions you might have? Does the committee have any questions for Ms. Paulson? All right, then. Um, our, first, our first candidate for review this morning is Gary Hansen. Mr. Hansen, if you'll please step forward, state your name for the record, and your interest in um, serving on this particular board. Good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Hansen. Um, I am uh, a longtime arts administrator in Cuyahoga County, having worked among other things, for 28 years for the Cleveland Orchestra. I am now virtually retired, and I am uh, very interested in serving the community through the CAC board. Nice and brief. So we have your um, we have your resume and your um, and your experience before us. Um, just just in. What would you understand your your core purpose of the um, what would you what would your understanding be of the Cuyahoga um, arts and culture? What do you understand the core purpose of it to be? The core purpose of <clears throat> the core purpose of CAC is to is to promote through funding the arts and culture of Cuyahoga County, which overall enhances the life of every every citizen of Cuyahoga County and certainly brings a great deal of attention from outside the county to the arts and culture activities within the county. So having been a part of that, wh where do you see um, opportunities for improvement? Well, opportunities for improvement uh, within the arts and culture uh, area of Cuyahoga County include greater public support, include greater participation, but probably most importantly, it, it, it centers on the increasing relevance and community engagement of each and every organization within the county. Okay. I also see you serve as a board member on the Ohio Arts Council. Based on your experience in that role, um, what do you believe is the role of a board member of a public agency? Um, the role of a board member of a public agency, um, first and foremost, is to ensure that the public funds are, are properly accounted for, properly deployed, and that the overall governance of the institution and the administration of the institution is prudently undertaken. And what would your priorities be if you were appointed as a new member? Um, my priorities would be, first and foremost, the priorities of CAC as they currently exist. Uh, in addition, it would, be, it would be the good governance and the good financial management of the institution. Um, and do I, I'll open up to my colleagues if you, yes, Councilwoman Conwell. Um, the, the chair to Mr. Hansen. So um, 
Are you familiar with how the CAC board has ran in the past in terms of awarding the um, financial um, awards to the various organizations? And I'm just wondering what your thought process is on that, if you do, do know how they currently conduct um, their award, award presentations for <laughs> grants. Um, I have, I have, a, I have a, a broad general knowledge of how CAC has awarded grants in the past. Um, I think you, you may know that my, my involvement with the effort to create the, the revenue source goes all the way back to sort of issue 38, then issue 18, and then most recently the, the uh, passage of issue 8. Um, I've been well, well connected to the administration and to several of the previous board members of CAC. And certainly as, uh, as an executive at the Cleveland Orchestra, I understood CAC quite well because we were, we were a grant, grant recipient organization. Do you, specifically, do you feel that uh, it's a fair process with having out-of-state um, panelists um, and, um, and why? Uh, the, the certainly, certainly, you need you need impartial uh, you need impartial peer reviewers in order to review arts and culture organizations. It is a very it's a standard practice. Um, the uh, every arts council that I know of uses a peer peer review committee system, and the the peer review the peer reviewers need to be uh, completely independent and disassociated from the grant recipients or the grant applicants. Ohio Council, you sit on that as well. Mm -hmm. Is it a similar? I know, you, I know they have a peer review, but are they out of town peer review? Yes, they are. They're out of state. Thank you. I'll defer to Purnell and follow Purnell. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Hansen, uh, there have been uh, concerns from the community, uh, uh, voicing, voicing concerns ar around how the monies have been uh, allocated. Some of those concerns have been expressed in the CAC meetings. Are you aware of any of those concerns? Or I'm, I'm, I'm generally aware, but not specifically aware. I think in the past two years, I've probably attended only one CAC meeting, which was in October of 2017. And at that, at that meeting, uh, there were few, if any, concerns expressed about the, about the distribution of the funds. The concerns, some have been, well, let me start by saying our, our larger institution is truly a gem and an a, a asset to this community, the, the Cleveland Orchestra, the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Rock and, Hope, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and Idea Stream, uh, assets that are, are without parallel and couldn't say enough good things about them. Uh, but the concern is many in the community, in the arts community, who have been over the last year or so since the uh, levy has taken place, mm -hmm. have gained a greater awareness, awareness of, the, uh, of CAC, have begun to apply. And we're starting to hear a, a drumbeat of, of concerns around how the dollars are, are allocated. There's been an effort towards diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. in these new outcries. What is your position? How do you feel? Um, what would you see as a, a strategy to move forward to to recognize all everyone's concerns and at the same time recognize the, the value that our, our large institutions bring to this community? Um, well, at the strategic level, I think probably the single most important thing is transparency. That the, that the, that the criteria, the activities, the, the uh, judgment that's exercised be transparent to all. Um, and I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to make an assumption that, uh, that, there, has been, that there has been transparency. Um, whether, or not it has been, whether or not it's been widely recognized, I can't speak to. But, uh, but from a strategic standpoint, transparency is the most important thing. Certainly, the, uh, the uh, dissemination of information about what, what, uh, what the qualifications are for an organization that is seeking funding and dissemination and even and assistance in putting applications together so that they meet the criteria um, are an essential step toward making sure that every organization, large and small, that deserves a portion of the funding has access to it. 
would you be willing to, to look at the funding formula as part of the solution and strategy and how this uh, new efforts towards inclusion are, are addressed? Would you be uh, willing to consider uh, any creative adjustments to the, the funding formula uh, that de determines how the monies are distributed into the community as part of the overall solution? Certainly, to the extent that the Board of CAC has authority over the funding formula, I, as a board member, I would absolutely look at the funding formula and make sure that it was properly serving the county. There may be aspects of the funding formula that are, that are, that are a product of the enabling legislation at the state, at the state level, in which case, should the Board of CAC wish to have this, the funding formula at the state level change, I, I presume that we would go through that, that appropriate process at the state level. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, Mr. Hanson, thank you very much for coming down and for your willingness to serve and for appearing before us in person. I also want to uh, pursue some diversity and inclusion issues, which is why I wanted to give the Vice President the first shot on that. But uh, my first question is, uh, is whether you did diversity and inclusion work at the orchestra that you were personally involved in, and if so, what did you do? Um, the answer is yes, um, and certainly over my tenure at the Cleveland Orchestra, the, the, the efforts um, and activities and focus on community engagement increased enormously. I began working at the orchestra in 1988. I retired from there at the end of 2015. Um, I have to say that probably one of the initiatives that I'm most proud of um, which, uh, which we undertook in the final four or five years of my tenure there, was the, was the establishment of the Cleveland Orchestra's neighborhood residencies, where we took the orchestra, the, the whole orchestra, for a full week into a series of neighborhoods uh, throughout the county, um, beginning with Gordon Square, and then the last one that uh, was initiated uh, under my leadership was the neighborhood residency in Huff. Um, through those residencies, the orchestra... Uh, undertook an enormous number of partnerships with small organizations in each of the neighborhoods and uh, I believe made a significant impact not only on the neighborhood but on the nature of the institution itself to where I, I believe that by the time I left the Cleveland Orchestra that community engagement was equally important, was an equally important goal of the institution as, as was and is artistic excellence. Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Hansen, uh, the, uh, the participation of the minority community in arts and culture in, in, uh, in Greater Cleveland uh, reflects the wider disparities that, uh, that exist in our community. And, and my question is whether uh, you believe that CAC should try to use arts and culture as a way of, uh, of helping to bridge and overcome the, uh, the wider disparities that exist in our community? And if yes, how would you go about it? Um, let me first say that I believe that our arts and culture institutions have a responsibility to do that. Um, and CAC's work is, is almost entirely expressed through the work of the arts and culture institutions. Um, CAC bringing focus to issues of, of diversity and inclusion, CAC bringing focus to areas of community engagement is, is an important portion of what they do in terms of distributing grants to arts and culture organizations. Um, but I don't think that CAC alone can do it. I think CAC must do it through the organizations. And I do think that, uh, that uh, on balance, since the formation of CAC probably now 11 or 12 years ago, the, the community engagement activities of the arts and culture organizations, large and small, has increased enormously. And I believe that is, that is, that is due to 
CAC's encouragement. It's also due to the encouragement, the very, the very um, powerful encouragement of the major foundations, of the Cleveland Foundation and the Gunn Foundation, in those same directions. I have no further questions. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Through the chair to Mr. H uh, Hansen, for purposes of better transparency, would you recommend awards being allocated every year and not two years? There was a cycle that um, that's what they were doing in the past, but then there was a cycle, I don't know if it was 15 and 16 or budget year 16 and 17, that they just did two years instead of having that whole process again. That's a question that I am wholly unqualified to address. Okay. But it is one that I would consider and consider seriously uh, if I am uh, appointed to the board of CAC. Thank you. Okay. Madam uh, Chair? Yes, go ahead. Just to follow up to that question, every two years op there are the operating dollars are, are distributed. And there are project dollars, I believe, that are, are um, being allocated annually right now. Mm -hmm. As part of the overall strategy and solutions that I, I hope and desire your, the board is able to come up with. I, I hope that the two-year operating dollars are, again, part of the, the inclusion effort, finding equitable ways of, of distribution for those in the community in terms of operating dollars that we offer and, and as well as the project dollars that are actively being um, distributed as we speak or applied for as we speak. I appreciate very much hearing that. It would be that that... that Perspective is something that I would certainly take into account in my work as a as a board member. All right. Well, with the um, with the executive director recently leaving her position with the agency, what um, challenges and opportunities do you see um, presented by her departure? Um, leadership change is always hard, mm -hmm. and um, and so. The, the challenge is that with, uh, with an interim administration and with uh, changes on the board, that the institution will need to um, find its way, um, and perhaps in a new way. The, uh, the question of whether or not there's an opportunity, I'm a glass half full kind of guy, and I always think that uh, when you have an opportunity in front of you, which is change, that change can always and should always be for the better. So do you, what, what would you believe would be important for the search process then for a new leader? Um, I've been involved in a lot of search processes. Um, the, uh, uh, without taking you through it step by step, the, the board of CAC needs to be very clear on what, ki what kind of a leader, what kind of qualifications, um, uh, CAC is looking for, that the first step and, and the most important step is defining what is, what is required and what is desired in a new leader. And if, if I were to put you on the spot here, could you name one or two things that you would identify as something that would be required or desired in the new leader? Um, certainly. I'm happy to speak to that. Um, in, my, in my view, uh, for, for an institution like CAC, which is now a mature institution, it is very important that, uh, that the next leader, in my opinion, have experience having led something. That, uh, that I do think that the the, 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 what, what's, what's needed in, in somebody who is responsible for an institution as important as CAC, an institution that gets as much appropriate public scrutiny as CAC, that CAC will need somebody who has, has direct experience having been a leader, possibly of a public institution in the past. And um, some would call the, the, the resource of funding for the CAC regressive. Do you have any um, thoughts on what we could do moving forward to maintain or sustain the resources um, for the CAC outside of the, the cigarette tax? Okay, so um, do I have any thoughts? I have, I have hopes. Um, the, question of, the question of finding an additional source of funding for Cuyahoga County Arts and Culture is a very big question. And uh, certainly the, the overwhelming support for Issue 8 
indicates that the citizens of Cuyahoga County are, are, are on balance very well disposed to funding arts and culture. That being said, the county has, has many needs and certainly any source of revenue for, for county purposes needs to be looked at in the context of the overall needs of the county. As a board member of CAC, I would be certainly active in advocating for the needs of arts and culture, but certainly not to the detriment of the overall needs of the county. Okay. Well, I thank you. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns from the committee? I'll just share a thought. Yes. Okay. Uh, in, in our previous government, we had three commissioners, and now with 11, I found we are, are much more close to our to our uh, constituents, uh, much closer, and uh, we, we're able to hear their concerns and, and literally attend a ward club meeting or a block watch meeting where you might not have found from the commissioners. So that, that, that process has had its strength and maybe some weaknesses, um, but but one, one strength it showed was when the levy came, we were able to go into the community and advocate and, and, and add an extra strength to, to make sure our, our, our levy did pass. And, and it did. We were able to go into residents who were very distant from the levy and didn't give it much consideration and actually encourage them to, to be supportive. Um, but then the other side of it is then they come back <laughs> and they say, hey, we voted. You know, sure. we, we contributed and we want, we want a, a share, just a fair share. Uh, uh, but, but that's what we're, what we're seeing here. And uh, I hope as you look in, uh, to the next leader, it's someone who is, who is receptive to, to the ideas of, of, of diversity and inclusion. I'm glad you said that. Um, I, I'll, I'll just share one anecdote if I can with mm -hmm, you. Sure. Since I joined the board of the Ohio Arts Council, and with no, with no credit to me personally, the Ohio Arts Council has undertaken a program which is called Fund Every County. And so the OAC has made a very significant, and very, very focused effort to ensure that the OAC is touching every county, organizations in every county, or individuals in every county, with grants. Um, I, uh, cer certainly the, the move from the commissioners to the county council is a move that I think, whatever the weaknesses may be, overall has strengths. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly the, the having the opportunity to work with the various council persons in the various districts is an important way that, that agencies like CAC can, can contribute to the overall benefit of the county. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? All right, Mr. Hansen. Um, I, I, I think you can tell this body um, diversity and inclusion is of great importance. And um, the large institutions, we're not taking anything away from them. They are greatly valued. but. Um, we want to see the, the resources spread, it, um, spread around to those particularly in the smaller organizations um, because that is a high priority for us. They have a tremendous uh, value that they bring and so we want to make sure that whomever serves on this board recognizes the, um, that as a priority. So with that being said, I will um, make the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a, we'll, we'll hold that until we have our reappointment. But I, I think I, if you'd like to stay, you, you, you're most certainly you. welcome to. But I think you will be uh, moving on to, to our full body of the council. I won't make any prejudgments for my <laughs> council members. But uh, I will uh, respectfully thank you for coming in and sharing with us your time and your perspective. And congratulations on your appointment. And we look forward to... Um, working with you in that capacity. I'm going to ask if our next candidate for, yes, if our next candidate will come up, Ms. Sharna Sherman. And if you'll state your name for the record. Yes, and give good us morning. A bit of I'm Charna Sherman. Char oh, I'm sorry. I'm so no, sorry. Charna. No problem. It's actually a difficult name <laughs> because of the cha and the show. Okay. So three years ago, uh, you all unanimously uh, voted me in as a board member of Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. And at the time, I had delved into, in some depth, my extraordinary passion for the arts, my extensive involvement in the arts communities, both here and nationally, and also my, and somewhat responsive to your concerns today, my genuine belief that the arts 
really lead to transformative change, not just for the individuals in our communities, but for our entire community. And it's incredibly important that we use our dollars for transformational change. Um, I won't take your time today to um, you know, go through m my revival on, on that score, but what I will do is update you briefly on uh, our success and really some of our challenges which have, have come up today. Um, I am now uh, the vice president of the board, and I um, actually am the board member with the longest longevity uh, I'm it. So I'm, I'm the history of the board at this point. I came on uh, right after the successful uh, passage of issue eight, and it's been a critical, but actually very productive three years. We did spend a fair amount of time and a fair amount of resources going back to the breadth of our communities and actually engaging in what we called a listening project, listening to the needs and the desires of those who we are intended to serve and asking them how do they want us to direct our funding for uh, the next 10 years and especially in the face of what we know at this point without an additional source of funding, a certain decline. And as a result, we endeavored to set uh, specific priorities to streamline our grant procedures and specifically to bolster our commitment to equity and diversity and to broaden our reach. Now, as a result, I, I, I submit to you that this program truly is an example to the rest of the nation and is, as I travel the country in my various uh, capacities, hear that regularly. And we should be incredibly proud that we have this unique source of funding. And just by way of example, uh, you know, just go down, you've mentioned today, but go Playhouse Square is now a, a major contender with respect to the performing arts in our country. But at the same time, during these years, when I came on, Karamu was literally on the, the brink of folding. And today, uh, a panel literally lauded it for the extraordinary progress that it has made and has an extraordinarily promising future. So um, I hope you will, act we actually are an incredibly you know, important point of transition with the resignation one of our current CEO and also of our current uh, board chair. And so I hope that you will agree that continuity, at least some measure of it, is important as we go forward and figure out how, how we transform ourselves with respect to a search for a new director and how we run ourselves. And also that I ask you for your uh, support. I'm here to answer any of your questions. I might well be um, in a better position to, to answer some of them than Mr. Hansen was. That's one kind of well. Through the chair to Sharna. Charna. Charna. <laughs> I was named after my great aunt who lived in Poland and it's actually a Polish name. And who's the current CEO? The current CEO is our interim uh, CEO Jill. Jill Paulson. Yes. Okay. And your current board chair? Well, technically, um, Joe doesn't resign. Joe Gibbons doesn't resign until you vote in his successor, Ed, which would be uh, Mr. Hansen. So at that point, and uh, we have specifically as a board waited to determine who would be the next chair so until we have constituted who the new board is. We thought it was only fair that Mr. Hansen have a, a vote and a say in that decision. Okay, and I was wondering if that process was, even though someone fits, uh, fills a chair seat, that you would still have elections again amongst the... Oh, we'll absolutely have elections, and I assume that for the uh, 10 minutes where we are required to have a, the meeting run up until that vote, that will, uh, I will have to assume that temporary spot. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Mr. Hansen. <clears throat> for the purposes of better transparency, would you recommend awards being uh, allocated every year and not two years? You said you go back three years, so I don't know if that that happened during the time that you were on the board? Actually, uh, I think there might be just a touch of confusion. Uh, when we uh, started with the new granting process, um, we, we did change 
our procedures and you have to break them up as to our uh, GOS recipients, our project support recipients, and our uh, artist funding. Uh, at one point, uh, in order to help the uh, streamline the budgeting process, we, uh, I believe, allowed the GOS recipients uh, three years until we could catch up. Okay. Um, the two year is actually intended to uh, decrease the burden on them uh, to constantly have to come in and do it. So it, that's only as to um, the GOS recipients. So that's, those are the institutions, as you indicated, that we re know relatively well, we know what they're doing, and so, um, and they're the ones who are subject to a uh, formula. Um, we now do have as to, um, I believe, to project support two years, and um, but we have specifically also tried to streamline the project, uh, the application process for them because it is a very burdensome uh, application process. And if you're a, if you're a small organization who's only seeking a few thousand dollars to have to go through umpteen hoops in order to even apply, it becomes its own barrier. So with respect to our concern actually for broadening our reach and increasing access for um, uh, those we haven't reached before, our, our procedures are actually intended to accomplish that, not actually be a barrier. Should there be a, a different process for smaller organizations? Well, we do have, we, okay. we do. The, the small organizations do not have to do it the same way that the uh, general operating support uh, recipients do. And one last question. In, in, in terms of the listening project um, around the various neighborhoods, um, I attended one of them. So there were recommendations that came from that um, would you say in your experience that um, many of those recommendations that were from the community were adhered to or listened to and, and really given a, a fair shake? Well, I don't want there to be a, an ounce of doubt uh, with the council. We actually addressed and voted on a commitment to equity and that we are going to be endeavoring to ensure that not just artist funding, which is where most of perhaps some of uh, the, the coverage uh, and debate over that occurred, but throughout that our general operating support recipients demonstrate a commitment to equity and access, and some of them actually have, are now taking their programs out to the community and not just within, uh, not just bringing those into the walls, but they're also, if you, if, honestly, if you just pull up, even as to the Cleveland Museum of Arts, a uh, new uh, strategic plan, equity resonates throughout it, including equity on their staff, equity in their purchasing, and, and that sort of thing. Now that's, our monies go to general operating support, but we are committed to making sure that there is demonstrated uh, a commitment to equity, even in those dollars. Um, and then there, there's no question that um, some of the concerns that we're um, sure were, were uh, raised at the listening project that you went to ended up in the debate over artist funding. Um, now, and just so you all understand, artist funding really is the smallest pocket of uh, monies uh, that we distribute. And one of the reasons is, is it's unusual for us to actually fund individual artists. As you know, we mostly fund almost entirely organizations, which is due to our charter. So we had traditionally worked with another nonprofit to distribute the artist funding. And I will tell you that um, you can probably still check some of the daggers in my back of when I stood up quite strongly in, in wanting to make sure that our artist funding dollars actually were, were distributed more equitably. Uh, we've had some bumps and starts in that, but there's no question now that we are on a path to implement new strategies to make sure that the artist funding dollars um, reach a broader uh, group of artists. Uh, Council, 
Good morning, Ms. Sherman. Good morning. And uh, Madam Chair to Ms. Sherman, I, I have just, just one line of inquiry, which I deliberately saved for you because as an experienced board member, I thought you might be better positioned to deal with it. And uh, that uh, has to do with the primary funding mechanism for, uh, for CAC. As you know, you have a, you have a 10 year levy with a, with a, a declining revenue source. And, and uh, I've heard talk of uh, a 15% decline this year, which is more than I would have expected. And uh, my question is, uh, Looking forward to the next time when 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 we have to renew funding for the uh, for arts and culture, how inclined are you to try to come up with a new source of funding that that uh, provides more stable funding and uh, and if so. Uh, do you have any ideas as to what that that might look like, and and uh, how soon do we need to start working on putting that together? So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that question. Well, thank you for that question, and I would simply say to you that the number one thing we heard from every listening project that we went to was, we need more money, not less, in this program. Because there is this incredible need and desire for these dollars to, to really help transform our communities. Uh, there are several, uh, let me first address the 15% decline. There is, it's not that there was a 15% decline. What, what happened is that we had to project to make sure that we had budgeted enough money over the 10-year levy to make sure that we had money in the 10th year to distribute. So everybody, not just, well, you know, not just the big institutions, but also our project grants, everybody took a hit. They took a hit of, a, of different sizes, but they took a hit. And what we also tried to do was to add some uh, certainty uh, to our funding. So we, what we did is, yes, you took more than you might have had to that year, but what we said to you is, this is what you're going to get for two years. Again, back to the two years. So you can, it's because we, what we heard from some of uh, the organizations, both small and large, is it helps to know what we've got and that we can plan for beyond just May and we can go actually to next May or that kind of thing. So that's part of, of what you heard with respect to, to the decline. And I will tell you, our numbers this month were a little rattling. We had a, we had a significant decline in, in the dollars coming in, and we can't quite explain it, and our fingers are still crossed, and we don't have to make any drastic cuts for the, this two-year cycle, but our antenna are up. As to the future, there's no question that we need to start thinking about it now. And one of the things that's going to be very important with respect to our search of a new CEO is someone who, who's got that as a, a key focus and moving forward on it. And in addition, we, we need and have addressed, even in, in this period of some tension, telling everyone in the community that what we need is to all coalesce and work together, including those entities such as PACs who, who actually have the legal authority to proceed as you're speaking, whereas we, we do not, uh, but to work together in trying to create the support that will allow us to go to the legislature and uh, make recommendations that really make sense. I mean, there obviously are ones out there that out of the blue seem to make sense, but we don't know whether they're feasible or possible or not. And uh, the current funding ends when? Uh, I'm going to, let's see, so I came in three years ago, 10 years, uh, I can't give you an exact date, but I th think we're in the second year of it. And uh, some of these things that, that could make sense, what are they? You read the papers as well as I do. Um, it could be vaping. It could be marijuana. It could be uh, some other sort of syntax. I don't know. It could be pop. I, <laughs> it's hard to know. 
Uh, we're, you know, one of the things we want to bring to the table is the experience of uh, a director who's familiar with what else is going on in other parts of the country where significant dollars have been brought in, dealt with differently, but significant dollars have been brought in. Okay, well, I would just close by saying that, uh, that I'm a strong supporter of the idea that we need a new, new and better funding source, and I'm willing to work with you folks and, and uh, see what I can do to contribute to that. Well, we couldn't appreciate that more. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Councilman Miller asked some of my, some of my questions. So uh, maybe I'll just come back. Uh, uh, a little more transparency on the funding formula process. Mm -hmm. When does that, when does the process start? When do you have to have, what, is, what are some timetables around when you but, calculate what the formula will be? Well, what? again, I want to I want to yeah. come back to there's a formula. A formula. Okay. Um, we have different pockets of dollars, and each essentially is on its own track. Uh, so, for example, uh, project support dollars uh, were just uh, the first part of getting those was just recent, recently, uh, the date just recently occurred. And just for purposes of transparency, do you understand? I mean, we have that, we push it out on the web, we do whatever we can to make sure that people are aware of that. And we have, I mean, one of the legacies that our former uh, uh, director left us is an extraordinary staff who have gone out of their way uh, to take calls, help people with applications, do whatever it takes to, so that we can push out more uh, interest and more applications in order to, to get it. So d different ones work on, on different schedules. What is the size of the staff? Well, right now, what, Jill, what is the size of our staff? Uh, eight? We have eight now. You we're short, and you understand we're short because we don't have a, a director. You, you we have an interim director, yes. You mentioned the project dollars, which are annual. The the operating dollars, what, and you said it's one formula. When do you, I'm trying to get a sense of when the board actually, is there a set time when you start to think about what the formula will, will look like in terms of the operating dollars since, since well, that's two years? Well, I will tell you there has been um, the the, general operating support dollars, there is a formula. There has been concern um, expressed at some of our, I'm not gonna call them listening sessions, we've done community uh, partner evenings where we've invited uh, our recipients to come in and talk about their issues. And there, there has been discussion about whether we should or shouldn't change the formula for the general operating uh, support dollars. We have, um, it's still on our agenda to see whether or not there really is enough there. And, and every, there are untoward consequences to every change. It doesn't necessarily always come out the way you think a, a, a change might. So various, there, people think that the general operating support dollars only um, relate to large institutions. And that's actually not true. There are, are small institutions who are also in that, but that have been in business long enough and who find applying for general operating support, support dollars uh, more advantageous than applying for a project um, and have succeeded and do it. Spaces is, is an example of that, where and Spaces budget is wildly smaller than the Cleveland Museum of Arts uh, budget. But we, the formula is largely driven by budget, and yet I will tell you that even some of those with the largest budgets have expressed concern with our formula for GOS. So it's on the table, um, but again, it's a, it's a two-year issue, and right now that's, it's, it's not the most burning one on our table. Do you hold the smaller institutions to the same standard for, for applying for these operating dollars as the larger institutions? Yes. Uh, there is a general operating uh, support. They, they compete like any other general operating uh, support uh, applicant. And again, I have no experience in that area, so I'm certainly just speaking out of uh, just a layman's perspective. Is, do you see, uh, would it be worth considering a formula that 
um, that looked at the saw the, the obvious differences between a larger and a smaller institution, and um, if there's any equity that's found in the recognition that they are they both need operating dollars, but they're two different sizes, and, we, and an we approach still, that recognizes that. Yes, we as I indicated, it is. It, trying to address how we ensure, and it's really not just an issue of equity, but how we uh, measure and assess public benefit has become a clear priority of ours, and I, it's, it's on the table. Okay. I, we, I don't have an answer for you yet, but it's on okay. the table. <laughs> right. Fine. Uh, you mentioned the listening tour, uh, and, and you did answer, but could you share again what were some of the things that you heard from the community on the listening tour that you that you you took to heart you you heard well you, I think for, uh, for me the thing that stuck with me uh, the most and again it comes back to my um, belief that art can transform not just individuals but can transform communities and there was um, incredible response to uh, dollars spent bringing people together and I, I'm, I'm it's probably obvious and in some respects amusing but people said they also like to have food at these mm -hmm. events so that they could actually spend time you know eating and sharing together now that doesn't mean that we fund the food but it does mean that we can consider those those opportunities where people can experience each other together and um, I thought that that t tended to resonate. If you want, um, and I'm really interested, that we we actually had a, uh, a wonderful thing on our, our website that had in bubbles, uh, given the size, that, that where we measured what people said, and the more they said a certain thing, the bubble is bigger. So we have this entire um, map, really, of, of ways in which uh, the listening tour uh, led us to this idea of um, inclusion. All right, well, thank you. All right, um, if there, Councilman Gallagher. Uh, hello. Hi. The listening tour, where did the listening tour go? We went out of our way to make sure we went not just broadly, but to places that we thought we had never been before. It was, in, it was incredibly important. And if you go, we actually had um, this group of, of young folks who literally went to to places and interviewed people on the streets. And we went um, to libraries and other where we called people from the communities to come in. And it was really our point to try and listen, not to those we hear from all the time, but those that actually we hadn't heard from before. I would, uh, I, I would, uh, and I don't know if this is a caution or a help, but in our pursuit of equity and inclusion, without fairness, you've lost your way. Agreed. And, and I keep hearing this inclusion and equity, and it concerns me without fairness being attached and being the guiding light. I, I, I maybe don't understand the distinction um, that you're drawing, but fairness must and always has to be a, a guiding principle for public funds. And even as, for example, um, we've addressed the difficult issue of individual artist funding, mm. we've, we've continued to maintain that, yes, there's, there still has to be uh, standards uh, so that we don't get, you know, we had testimony of, of a previous recipient who got up and said, you know, I'm working on a movie and I'm the only one who should get to see it, that, that the kind of monies that went to her were, are, aren't the fair way right. to distribute our dollars. And so that there have to be standards about public benefit uh, that, trend, that uh, go throughout all of our, all of our uh, spending and funding decisions. Well, I've, I've, I've always uh, been a great admirer of the art. And the only reason being is I can't do it. I no can't matter, either. No matter how hard <laughs> I've tried... And it was my last class at Cleveland State was Art 101. And it was the toughest thing I've ever gone through in my life. And I, and I had a greater appreciation after that. So I think what we're doing here is, is so important. 
and it does have to touch the lives of just about everyone that you can reach. But my thing is, is it needs to be fair and equitable. There is as much color as there is in art, there's no color. Either you do it or you don't. Now it's how you disperse it is, is your mission. And that's why I say fairness. And let me just respond that I, and it actually follows up on, on a question you asked. We actually have a map um, that shows with dots all the breadth of where our dollars have touched in this county. And uh, so if ever a constituent of yours comes and says, we're not getting, you know, there, there actually is evidence that it might not be what they wanted, but it doesn't mean that dollars aren't going into your backyard because it is important. Thank you, Councilman. Um, so I like what you started out with, transformative change and um, in the listening tour. So you talked about setting priorities and um, bolstering some things, but were there any concrete actions that you have taken um, that were a result of the listening tour? I do think that our priorities uh, actually uh, addressed those as the most formative of our changes. And by that I mean that we, we actually put funding priorities uh, forward. I will tell you that um, some of the GOS recipients were, I mean, well, it, we obviously did a good job because everyone was upset. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And all right. And the GOS recipients thought that we had given them more of a haircut than they deserved. And yet, at the same time, um, we said we're going to stop growing uh, project support. Um, not that we won't. We will continue to um, reach out and draw in uh, more recipients. Um, if they're in and reach out to them, but that we did actually uh, say that we're not going to make it a priority to grow that program and lessen until we get more funding. And just for, for my reminder and our listening audience, GOS? General operating support. Okay. That's sort of the, just to, took me a long time to learn this, but general operating support is when we actually help fund the operations of uh, the funding recipients, whereas project support is you come in and say, I want to do this project, and we have two levels of it, and then you actually have to execute the project. Got it. And um, with regards to small versus the large, how do you define small? What's the, what's the cutoff or the, the definition relative to CAC as a small versus a large? Well, I actually think we have a lean back on this distinction um, too easily because it's actually not accurate, which is what I was trying to say. General operating support dollars go from large institutions even to small institutions. Um, so that money doesn't necessarily, although there are some major institutions who receive major funding under GOS, there are also small institutions that do as well. Um, there's a lot, again, I commit, there's a lot of hoops you have to get into to establish that you have been in business for a period of time, that you've established your public benefit, you've established your accounting. So oftentimes uh, you can imagine that a new organization or a small organization just doesn't have the staff to uh, say that's where we want to go, But which is why we have opened specifically um, and made uh, strides to, to make the application process for the project support much easier so that you don't have to go through as many hoops as necessary to get GOS dollars. So let me rephrase the question. Small, is it based on the size of the organization, the revenue the organization generates? How do we make the distinction, or, is, or are you telling me there is no? I, I'm simply saying that people resort to that, but that it's not necessarily. You can be a huge organization with a huge budget and say, I don't want all that oversight we're simply going to apply for project support. And I'll give you as an example of that. Um, the Cleveland Clinic uh, goes in for project support dollars, I believe. And they're a massive organization, but they, go, they have some extraordinary programs there of um, art-based therapy that have uh, broad reach, um, including not just right at, not 
just right at the clinic, but out in the communities that are really extraordinary programs and, and really incredibly compelling at, at this point in time, given uh, various medical issues in our community. So I don't, know, I don't know how to answer your question because I don't think that the distinction really fits. I, I know that people oftentimes fall back on thinking that only the large institutions are GOS and that small institutions apply for project dollars, but that isn't actually true. There might be more than not, but it's, it's not a complete distinction. But I would think that people mostly refer either to their budgets or the amount of dollars we give them. Okay. And you talked a little bit about the artist funding. Can you name one or two artists that you have funded? Well, the problem with artist funding right now and one of uh, the issues we've been uh, dealing with is that since uh, we ceased uh, the program that was housed at CPAC, uh, we have not um, reinstituted uh, the kind of funding that we had in the past. So we're, we're working on doing that. We just announced uh, this month a program that is going to go into effect, but it's not to individual artists. It's, it's, it's a... Um, it's a broader program, uh, but we are, until we can figure out um, how, to, how to distribute these dollars fairly, we are holding on to them and pushing them over to the next year if we can't do that. We, we just issued a, a request to everyone in the community to make proposals as to how do we do this? Do you have ideas? Will you work with us? Will you be the ones to help do it? And we're, we're waiting to hear back about them. So currently none. Right, currently none. Okay, right, thank you. which I will tell you, there is some debate in our um, on our board about that. I I have been pounding the pavement that I want our artist funding and artist hands, and I um, haven't prevailed yet. And the, let let me be clear: there's I'm not a, either a proponent or opponent of either. Just want to. Um, get that on the record and make the distinction. I, I think that if you, if we are searching for a fair and equitable distribution mechanism, that um, maybe holding on to those funds until we find one is probably a wise decision rather than just allocating them arbitrarily. So, oh well, we would never, we would never allocate them arbitrarily. The, the real issue is trying to find since we cannot ourselves fund artists, we need a, we are legislatively restricted to funding an organization, a nonprofit organization, it's finding the partner and the proposal that makes sense for uh, fairly and equitably uh, funding artists. And quickly, if I could just ask you to maybe identify one or two key things you'd like to see in the new executive uh, director. Well, um, I can tell you what I said at the last board meeting, which is it, I will, One, I clearly want someone with public uh, experience because this is, this is an unusual entity where, and I'm sure you've uh, dealt with this at all, where we actually can't talk about what we want to do except in a public meeting. So, and there's a lots of other rules. So uh, <laughs> public background. <laughs> you, you, do you get what I'm talking about? Yes, okay. So one, um, uh, public background to obviously an arts background, but what we're really looking for, at least, and, and it is incredibly important to me, is that this knotty issue of whether you call it fairness or equity or inclusion is the issue really front and center on uh, in major issues across, uh, in major institutions across the nation. What we want is the person who's experienced and involved and brings to the table uh, the kind of, of direction and leadership and hands-on uh, uh, experience doing it so that we can take what's, what's best out there in the world and bring it right home to Cleveland and Cuyahoga County and implement it uh, quickly and fairly. Well, thank you Madam very Chair. much, Ms. Sherman. Uh, Chair, yes, Councilman. Oh, thank you. I, it, give, to give back to you to make sure I understood, um, Tom Shorgel, what was the name of his organization? With CPAC, yes. CPAC. So once he retired, he was the his organization was the one that uh, that you were legally able to give dollars to to see that monies went into the hand of local artists, if that's correct. If, 
leaving aside his retirement, okay. we had previously housed the distribution of individual artist dollars at CPAC. We ended that contract uh, actually based on our concerns about uh, equity and fairness. Mm, all right, and there was a kerfuffle around that. If I can um, describe uh, kerfuffle that. is um, actually a um, diminished right. word. Diminished word. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so has there any consideration as you look for a, another nonprofit? Maybe you have more than one. Actually, our request is to uh, currently is for to collect all ideas, and it may actually be the case. Uh, specifically, the group that we did ask to come together to um, address issues of artist funding and equity came back with a number of proposals, which were not simply giving grants to individual artists, but other kinds of ideas. So right now we actually have a work plan of at least five different objectives. I think that's the right number. Um, some of which, at least one of which, is uh, individual artist funding. Uh, and even as to that, it might be that there is that more might be better, that we have different ways in which of distributing those dollars. That's certainly one solution. Uh, I look back. In hindsight, it all that happened, and I imagine there would not have been a kerfuffle if there had been multiple organizations at that time uh, to implement the board's new direction for diversity and inclusion. Well, uh, our, then that would have, that would have uh, it would not have created the dynamics that we saw in the past. I, I honestly, that was it was before my time, and I, I don't want to have a view okay. one way or the other. I just know that uh, since my coming on to the board, yes, some of our uh, discussions uh, have, have been difficult, but honestly, these are issues which oftentimes are, are difficult to discuss and certainly to discuss in public. But our ears have been open and our commitment has been unwavering. And we are prepared to have the difficult discussions and, and make the tough decisions that ensure at the end of the day that these monies are fairly distributed for the public's benefit. Right. That was a significant reason why, why, why you hear so much now from this board this council in regards to the, the to the funding mechanism, simply because it uh, things would work much more smoothly in my estimation, you know when when everyone involved gets uh, it's. I think you understand. I I, I want to use the, use the right words to describe it, um, but it, I, I hope that we're moving in the direction where the things that were before you uh, don't happen again. And, and everyone collectively, and we all want to work together, all the, the large institutions, small one. The ultimate solution, I think, will be one that uh, allows everyone to, to go ex coexist peacefully and, and work together. No one takes their toys and goes home. No one is always banging on the doors of the, of the board and having to have, give public outcries for, uh, for their concerns. And I, I think this board is capable of finding that that solution. I one thank all of you today mm -hmm. for for pressing me uh, on these issues, and because it's just as important to hear it from all of you as it is for those who show up at our meetings or or contact us in other ways. What I want you to know is that we are committed, and that includes even difficult conversations and even difficult decisions, but we are committed to equity and fairness, and we intend to make the changes and implement the programs that actually will accomplish that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If there are no further questions, comments, or concerns, then, oh, yes, I'm sorry, Councilwoman Conwell. And I know time. I'm looking at the time, Chairwoman. Um, Charna? Charna. You got it. Okay. Break over the summer. You just I just missed a board meeting. So what will be done over the two months? Will there be anything done over the two months that you guys are breaking for the board meeting? It, actually, yes. Uh, okay. We specifically um, left the uh, last board uh, meeting uh, charging what we called the search firm team uh, to a research uh, search firms, again, with equity, uh, what I indicated of equity and uh, 
experience being uh, important in that regard. And to then, uh, once we have a number of uh, search firm applicants, to call a special meeting so that we can uh, retain one of these firms. We think it's really important to move forward, uh, to, to get a director on board. And at that time, uh, we will actually also uh, discuss and presumably vote on uh, what the, we can't call it a committee, but what the uh, search team uh, will do, who they will be, and what they will do in terms of conducting a search with a search firm to get the best candidate uh, for the position. Thank you. All right. If there are no further questions, comments, or concerns from the committee, I'd like to move this legislation forward to the full body of the council under second reading suspension. Do I have a second? It's been moved and seconded. If there's no questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for your much. time and your service. Um, Council Clerk, I want to take the liberty of going a little bit out of order due to our time constraints. I know Mr. Uh, Keith Libman has a, another engagement. We usually don't go this long, so if you would read that item D into the record, please. Resolution number 2018-0124, confirming the county executive's appointment of Keith J. Libman to serve on the Cuyahoga County Audit Committee for an unexpired term ending 1231-2018. If you'll please step forward, state your name for the record, and give us a little bit of background in your interest in serving on this committee. Certainly. My name is uh, Keith Libman, and I do appreciate your indulgence in letting me uh, go first. I have an unavoidable noontime uh, commitment. Um, I've been uh, very uh, blessed in my life uh, to have two con uh, careers that uh, run concurrent. Uh, my so-called day job is an audit partner, um, currently with the firm of Bober Markey Fedorovich. I've uh, performed in audit-like capacities, uh, led audit teams, departments, uh, for literally my whole career, um, spanning getting close to 50 years, hard to believe. <laughs> um, but I've also had a parallel career in community service. I'm uh, fortunate enough to start early in my life um, in volunteer capacities. Uh, interesting, very uh, lot, lots of boards and committees like accountants <laughs> because uh, we offer something that uh, uh, not everyone has and the ability to, to perform a, uh, a real function. And that's led to a variety of leadership roles. Um, I think you have uh, in front of you probably my resume, so I don't, uh, uh, don't want to bore you with reading uh, or reciting what you could otherwise read. But one of the things that struck me uh, as I um, began to learn about the County Audit Committee, uh, I viewed its charter. And there are four criteria for um, the, the uh, members of the committee uh, are expected to substantially um, uh, have, uh, and they are experience in accounting, in auditing, in government operations, and financial reporting. Um, I think if you take a look at my background, you'll see I, I check those boxes. I'd just like to highlight a couple of situations that I think are analogous, and then I uh, obviously, hold myself open to your questions. Um, on my uh, bio, you see the private trust company. The private trust company is a nationally chartered bank under the uh, regulatory auspices of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. That's a, it's a mouthful. Um, it, it exclusively performs trust services. It's not a bank in terms of lending and, um, uh, and, and deposits. Uh, and it's also a wholly owned subsidiary of a very large public company. Um, my role on that board is, 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 is as an independent director, and I was an audit committee member uh, from the moment I got on the board. Uh, I got frustrated a number of years ago that the internal members of the audit committee um, were uh, rotating on a, on a regular basis. And uh, I stepped forward and I said, I think as an independent uh, director, perhaps um, serving as audit committee chair would make sense. And ultimately they agreed, even though that was a little bit unusual for a large public company to take somebody that was uh, not 
uh, an employee and put them in that position. Uh, in that capacity, um, deal a uh, tremendous amount with internal controls, um, the fiduciary responsibilities that are uh, required when you uh, are overseeing trust accounts, uh, um, total value of which are somewhere north of a billion dollars, and to do so in an environment where um, uh, there, there's a substantial federal regulator. So as I, I look at the experiences I've had, uh, that, that to me uh, seems that it, it, it is highly analogous to the kind of responsibility that a member of the Cuyahoga County Audit Committee has in providing oversight to the Internal Audit Department, which, uh, as I'm sure you are well aware, is, is, a, uh, is a different kind of department uh, within government because of the degree of independence that, that it must have. Um, you can also see a variety of nonprofit boards. Uh, something that doesn't show on here is uh, a number of years ago as a resident of Shaker Heights, I spent probably uh, eight or 10 years uh, working in uh, as a citizen member of uh, the City Council Finance Committee, uh, uh, Recreation Board, committees of the school board. Um, and again, because of my professional background, an awful lot of that was in the financial area. So I've, I, I've, I've touched government as well uh, in uh, my volunteer roles. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of uh, insight. My interest in serving has uh, um, spent my life doing things in public service. Um, this is an, another opportunity to do so. Well, I want to thank you for your willingness to uh, serve in this capacity, and I'll start out with a question. It's kind of a, maybe a little bit of a hot one. Um, some of the recent audits in the uh, internal audit department have resulted in criminal investigations, and um, as a board member of the audit committee, how would you balance the need for confidentiality of ongoing audits until they are final versus the request for information surrounding these ongoing audits? Well, um, I'm... I'm a very cautious person, and and uh, uh, the, the issue of confidentiality is something that's very important. It's ingrained in in, in my profession. Uh, I, I need to be candid with you that I don't have um, a clear understanding of the legal requirements in this particular venue for maintaining that confidentiality. Um, so I guess the best way I can answer that question is, I would not stray outside of the law, and my um, uh, my general sensibilities would be to protect confidentiality unless it was uh, obvious uh, that it wasn't appropriate to do so. Okay, so with that said, have you had an opportunity to review any of the recent uh, payroll audit or benefits audits that have gotten some of the media attention? Um, I, I have. Um, I, I, I read the newspapers, so I've seen that. Um, I have attended as a guest uh, the most recent um, audit committee meeting, uh, and so heard a little bit about it, but no, I have not studied it in detail beyond that, that surface level. Okay, I'll open it up to my colleagues if they have any questions, comments, or concerns. Councilwoman Conwell. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Uh, Liebman, um, one of the questions is, how do you expect to navigate the natural tension between the audit committee versus the executive agencies that internal audit is auditing? Um, clearly, looking at your back, just with, just with that question, um, the okay. ministry, I mean, you've got to audit them and the administration yep. and so and the administration is actually appointing you to this position so just uh, understood and 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 that's something that uh, I literally face every day of my life uh, clients hire auditors uh, the management and and the boards of, uh, of our client companies engage the, the audit firm uh, yet we have a duty to be independent it's a legal duty it's a licensing uh, duty and it's the ethics of my profession so um, uh, there is always a clear understanding and uh, whenever I engage in, in, uh, with any new client or in, in, in this case in, in this position with the county, um, thank you very much for hiring me, in, in this case uh, appointing. 
uh, and now I'm going to do my job, and that job requires independence. So, knowing what what you know and how, how you've conducted other <clears throat> committees, do you think it would be uh, a fair assessment to maybe have counsel uh, pick the audit person with that? provide a more openness and transparency, flipping it? Well, um, i presuming that there is a balance of power uh, in this process and that the appointment uh, came through the county executive, but the approval comes through county council. So um, uh, to that extent, I, I support that process and, and I, I see that the, um, uh, the approval uh, uh, authority that you have should provide that uh, uh, that comfort to the uh, the citizens of the county that people who are appointed through this process will uh, have, have passed muster and be expected to perform in that manner. Thank you. Any other questions from my colleagues? All right. Well, given the time okay. constraints, thank, thank you very much we'll for be respectful time of your time. Yes, and, and um, I will make a motion to move this to the full body of the council. Um, it looks like we may need to do this under second reading suspension. So I'll make the motion to move this under the full body to the full body of the council under second reading suspension. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and second. If there are no questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Uh, this will move to the full body of the council. And um, take another liberty and go back to item C. Resolution number 2018-0122, confirming the county executive's appointment of Kenneth G. Silliman to serve on the Gateway Economic Development Corporation of Greater Cleveland Board of Trustees for an unexpired term ending 5-31-2022. And I do see Mr. Carroll here, and we did go a little bit out of, uh, out of, out of order with uh, uh, Mr. Lipman due to his time constraints. But if you would so kindly, Mr. Carroll, come forward and give us a little bit of background with regards to this position. And uh, Mr. Silliman, if you will follow. Thank you, Madam Chair, members Thank of the committee. Um, I'm, I'm a member or current appointee of the Gateway Board, and the Gateway Board has five, uh, five slots, really. Uh, two appointed by the city, two appointed by the county, and then one person appointed jointly by the city and the county. So as you may know, um, Mr. Silliman has been appointed by the city officially, and uh, the executive is recommending him for the county's joint appointment, so, the, so joining with the city's appointment. Or there is agreement, obviously, there. Um, again, the board uh, really works closely with the teams, the Cavaliers and the Indians, on the facilities, uh, the, the two facilities. So uh, projects that get done work through Gateway. Gateway has a very small staff. Um, they work very closely with the physical plant issues, with the operational issues of the two teams. Um, when uh, any kind of large construction project happens, it basically goes through Gateway and the staff. Uh, they hire experts to assist with some of those processes. There's an ongoing process at Gateway where the teams make what they call major capital requests. So for large amounts of money, uh, large projects, and then Gateway determines, the board and the staff determine if it meets the standard for a major capital project. Uh, and then, of course, as you may know, the, the syntax funds those projects as possible. So um, I would just say, uh, you didn't ask me, but I would just say about uh, Ken, um, there's probably no more qualified person in this community than to, to serve this role. Um, with his background, I, I'm not sure if Ken sat on the board before. He may have. I'm not absolutely sure in his past uh, role at the city, but uh, has been very involved with all those related issues over time as the chief of staff at the city for a long period of time, as a former member of the law department at the city. So um, I, I, again, I wasn't asked, but I, I certainly could speak, speak to his uh, qualifications for this role. Well, thank you very much for giving us that background. Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns for Mr. Carroll? M C Councilman Gallagher and then Councilman Miller. Two city, two county, and one joint. This is for the joint. Yes, sir. Okay. Councilman, Councilman Miller. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Carroll, the... Uh, the Indians came out with a, a proposal that they they needed some some additional money f for repairs. They actually uh, 
the media tried to get, get me to comment on it before I knew anything about it, which I politely declined. But, but my question is, uh, is whether there, whether there is money available in, in the syntax fund to, to accommodate a, a request like that, this, or, or has all the money in, in the, in the syntax been uh, spoken for through the combination of of the bond funding that's been uh, done requiring debt service repayment plus any other allocations for specific repairs that have already been done. Through the chair of the councilman, there, as you know, the, there's a 20-year uh, extension of the uh, syntax monies towards towards the uh, you know the the two, the two facilities, and the first a first section of that money was bonded, so about 60 million dollars worth was bonded for projects. So not all of it has been bonded, uh, but that's that's a certain amount of it is spoken for. Um, of that 60 million that has been you know that been bonded and set aside. A uh, majority, if not all of that, has been, you know, applied to project approved projects. So there is a kind of a small, you know, fairly small residual amount every year in the bonding process after paying the debt that is available for projects. That's on every year there is a small amount, but it is not it is not uh, sufficient for a large request. That amount is you know, million or two million approximately that's available per year. So. Um, in many cases, the teams uh, will uh, make a make sort of their request to gateway. They'll get it approved, and then if there aren't immediately available funds, they will fund it themselves and be you know, reimbursed later. That's a common approach that the teams have used in the past uh, when they want to get a project done immediately. Okay, uh, follow up question. Uh... Has there been a resolution as to how this particular request is going to be handled, or is it still under discussion? Um, I know that they talked about a few different projects in that meeting. Um, the the board will the gateway board will approve uh, or not approve a project as meeting the standard for major capital. Then the board, as you as you probably know, sends the request to the county to assess whether funds are available. If funds are available, then County pays. If if not, then the teams have the option of uh, of advancing the funds themselves. Okay, thank you, Councilman Conwell. Through the chair to uh, Mr. Carroll, just wanted to know who was the board members. Uh, that's the county's appointee. The other county's appointee, in addition to myself, is Bill Reedy, and there tends to be a, a county employee appointed and a city employee appointed. So the but private citizen county appointee is, is Bill Reedy, longtime CFO, retired CFO, longtime uh, expert, finance expert. Uh, the, the city recently added new appointments. So David Ebersall is the city's new appointee as the director of economic development. Um, I think uh, I'm not sure the woman's name who was just appointed. She hasn't attended a meeting yet, but she's the city's sort of private citizen appointee. I don't have her name in front of me. Ken may know. Um, and then Ken would be the, the joint appointment. So it's about five. It's five. Any other questions, comments, or concerns from the committee for Mr. Carroll? All right, there being none, um, if you will step forward, Mr. Sullivan. Please state your name for the record and your interest and background in serving on this board. And I also like the record to reflect that this you would serve as the chairman if, um, if this body sees fit, correct? Yes. Okay, all right. Please uh, proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Ken Silliman. I will be brief in my opening remarks to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, I uh, was a city of Cleveland employee in a number of roles for a period of over 25 years. In those various positions, I had the opportunity to deal with all three of the city's uh, major sports franchises. Uh, also, during that time, uh, uh, and this is relevant to the, your consideration of me as a joint appointment, uh, I dealt with Cuyahoga County officials on a number of major projects, uh, going back to the, uh, the new convention center around 2011, uh, continuing with the syntax extension campaign, where I worked with one of your colleagues, very closely, 
and most recently on the Q renovation. Um, and additionally, non-sports related, the, the whole uh, jail issue was something that I had many, many, many meetings with county officials. So I do have experience uh, working with and hearing the county's perspective on various projects. Um, as far as diversity and inclusion, I worked under two mayors, Mayor Michael R. White in the 90s, and more recently, Mayor Jackson, since his election in 2006, continuing until my retirement last year. Um, each mayor viewed diversity and inclusion to be a part of every single project we did. Um, they, it was not separable from anything we did. A good example of that was the Opportunity Quarter Project, where you may recall from some of the news articles that uh, a couple years ago that we at the city more or less took our foot off the accelerator on that project because Mayor Jackson was not satisfied with the state of Ohio's uh, follow-up on some diversity and inclusion uh, commitments initially made uh, by Governor Kasich, and uh, those particularly affected our Fannie Lewis law. And so that I, I give that as an example of where a major $300 million project on the east side of the city of Cleveland uh, that we felt that the those issues were important enough that we were not going to move forward with the state of Ohio until they got addressed. So in terms of diversity and inclusion being a part of literally everything you do, that's an example. So I'll stop there and give you plenty of time for questions. All right, I, I will start. As a Gateway board member, would you think putting the Brown Stadium under the Gateway makes sense so that all three sports facilities are under one umbrella? Um, that, uh, Madam Chair, that's a political question for uh, Mayor Jackson's Cleveland City Council, uh, primarily because it, the stadium is, is city-owned, but certainly uh, County Executive County Council uh, would have their own views on that. Um, so I, 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 it would be inappropriate for me to weigh in on that, but I will say that the way things are structured now, it, it operates very close to that. Uh, and I say that because the city and county reached an agreement on a specific annual allocation from the syntax that is set aside for the football stadium. And so that, although it operates independently of Gateway, um, the right hand is certainly aware of what the left hand is doing. But ultimately, that's a government policy decision. Well, when you, you say that, it brings up another um, another topic with communicating um, Gateway's role to the public. And given the pushback that both the city and the county received with the Q deal, um, how do you perceive Gateway's role with communicating um, with the relationship building around the public public knowing the Gateway's decision making authority? Is there do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, Yes, um, Gateway's meetings are open to the public, and I believe they've been pretty uh, proactive in communicating uh, their decision making. And I know they are, are constantly focused on communicating on the diversity and inclusion uh, accomplishments. Um, I was very much a part of that. Uh, community controversy on the on the Q deal. Um, I've heard every opponent speak in every forum on every argument. Um, I would say that going forward, I view the Gateway entity to be a, a national pace setter for a number of reasons. First of all, it's very rare for a community to have a nonprofit organization that basically leases to two significant sports franchises and watches over the uh, finances pertaining to those sports franchises. 
Secondly, uh, because of your efforts at the county uh, back in 2014 that passed the extended syntax, I'm not aware of another community in the country that has a 20-year dedicated funding stream to ensure the maintenance and upkeep of our existing facilities. And to those various opponents of the Q deal or whatever might be coming down the tracks in the future, I would suggest that this community has done and is in a position to keep doing a better job of preserving what we have and not going the route of other communities that every 20 years they end up building a new stadium or a new arena because uh, people got tired of the old one. Um, I submit that we are in a position at Cleveland with the syntax extension to take an opposing view that we have three uh, centrally located, very fine sports facilities and a means to keep them there and thereby avoid a huge hit on either the county finances or the city finances that would occur if any time in the next 15 years we had to build new. And I, I would submit that that uh, is somewhat unique and creates the, 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 the avoiding that expenditure leaves that money available for other community needs. Well, you kind of let, let, are leading into another question that I have, which is when the current facilities are beyond their useful life, um, what do you see the roles of Gateway, the city, and the county um, as far as planning for any new sports facilities? Um, first of all, I think that the syntax extension um, coupled with what I would call midterm um, repurposings at all three facilities puts us in a position of having useful lives till the syntax extension expires in the year 2034. Um, back in 2013, the Browns, with um, help from the city of Cleveland, launched a $120 million midterm renovation of the football stadium that basically completely refreshed it and leaves it well positioned to last till 2034, in my view. The Q renovation, we all know the arguments there, and that that resulted in a lease extension until the year 2034. Uh, the Cleveland Indians undertook their own privately funded 30 some million dollar midterm renovation that kind of changed the right field area um, and opened up the concourses. Um, and um, you know, its lease expires in 2023, so that's more of an issue. But I, I would submit that the, the, the groundwork's there for all three sports facilities to have useful lives to the year 2034. And I think it's good public policy to keep that and not talk about new until 2035 or later. But ultimately, it's a question for the city and the county elected officials. Well, you touched on the Indians. Um, do you see, what challenges do you see with um, establishing a long-term lease with them? Um, the, um, the Indians uh, are pursuing a number of planning activities, looking at the market, looking at economic development opportunities uh, in the area around Gateway. And I think from what my conversations with Indians officials, that um, they uh, would prefer to defer any lease discussions until they've completed their own due diligence. But I would say on behalf of Gateway, if, if I am appointed, that that we, uh, since the uh, Indian's lease does expire in 2023, that's something that we need to keep front and center because um, we obviously want to see that extended. Okay, I'm going to open it up to my colleagues. Do you have any questions, comments, or concerns? Councilman Miller and then Gallagher. Uh, I'm, I'm looking far into the future, 
when we get to talking about new facilities. And uh, uh, I think uh, I think we can operate three facilities as long as the current three facilities are viable. Uh, but I don't think in in the long term future that our community can afford to build a new football stadium for football only that's used for for a ten or so dates a year and uh, and that if we're going to continue to be a three sports team community that that we're going to have to find a way to go back to what we did in the past, which is where the the Indians and the Browns play in the same facility and uh, and I'm inviting, I'm invi inviting your comment as 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 to whether uh, whether you see that as possible. I, I know the uh, the immediate response you get get from the teams is that uh, they overlap and they're two different things, and you need different kinds of facilities. But but I I just don't think we have the money for it, and and uh, so I wonder what you think. Um. Through the ch chair to Councilman Miller, um, I agree that this community, um, for the foreseeable future, and I say that goes till 2034, does not have the resources to build a new facility for any of the three um, uh, franchises. And therefore, um, my view is uh, I. I, the trends in the sports leagues that began in the early 1990s was that Major League Baseball pushed very hard for communities to build relatively smaller uh, baseball-oriented facilities, and that trend began uh, with Camden Yards in Baltimore and continued. NFL football, uh, watching that, began pushing for football-specific stadia, and that was uh, caught, we were caught in the middle of that trend with the whole Browns issue. Um, I think the respective sports leagues exert a tremendous amount of clout on those kind of decisions, and I, do, I think it would be a very difficult uh, proposition to move baseball and football into the same facility. Um, and therefore, my view, you asked for my personal view, is given that, do everything you can to preserve the useful life of the existing facility so you don't have to face that building new question. And I, I do understand with the less than 15 dates a year that it's, it's hard some of the football stadiums they're building these days are well over a billion dollars. Las Vegas, I think, is approaching two billion dollars. And this community does not have those kind of resources. Well, uh, I would say that uh, I could not agree with you more about the uh, about extending the existing life of the the uh, useful life of the current facilities uh, uh, this uh, this 25 to 30 year thing is is the norm but there are uh, there are a couple of baseball stadiums that have operated for over a hundred years and, and are still operating you, you know so uh, so I I uh, we need to be creative and think about that, and I think we we have done a pretty good job on on the uh, on the upkeep, and and gives us greater possibilities to uh, to extend their life. Uh, so so I agree that is the priority, but I think uh, at some point we're going to have to to deal with the question, and and uh, and I think if if we're going to do it in this t city. Hopefully, technology will be uh, be.
be improved by that time and, and that there may be uh, capabilities that we don't have now to do the, uh, do the joint facility uh, possibility. Uh, the other thing is just a comment that I, I put out uh, just to remind you that uh, uh, that baked into the Q deal that we agreed upon are, uh, are some provisions that, that would uh, uh, put the county in a better position regarding certain funding streams if we reach an agreement with the Indians in the next couple of years. And so, uh, so I would just uh, encourage you to try to take advantage of that if possible. Uh, through the chair to Councilman Miller, uh, I am very much aware of those terms. Uh, Mayor Jackson was very committed to that part of the deal. Uh, I'm surprised it didn't get more attention from the media when we were debating the whole Q deal because the Q deal was really about more than just the Q. It was essentially about what we've been talking about, preserving our existing assets and taking appropriate proactive steps to do that. And you're right that there's a 10-year funding stream starting in 2023 that goes into a special account for that purpose. And that is significant. And I think it's something we need to uh, keep reminding ourselves it's there, uh, particularly if we do end up in the near future in lease discussions with the Indians. Thank you. Councilman Gallagher. You mentioned the Q deal. I'll say it, you can't. You know, it was shakedown artists that came in here, saw some money, and thought they'd dip in. As you can see they're not here today, and they, they haven't been showing up since. So we'll see them the next time around. I see here you were uh, in Cleveland during the return of the Browns. Uh, no one seems to really know the full story. So now that you're in front of me, and I think you're going to have to answer, Tell me it was the NFL and not Cleveland that historically and up to now probably has never had vision to put that stadium where it was. Is, was that the NFL's doing? Um, well, uh, I am in position to fully answer your question. Um, the um, uh, Cleveland City Council um, in March of 1996, um, had to decide whether to approve a tentative deal that Mayor White had made with the NFL, which would guarantee a team coming back to Cleveland in three years. Um, and the NFL's very, very strong preference was that the new stadium would be built at the same location as the old on the lakefront. Um, City Council, as Councilman Miller will recall, uh, created a task force to do a very expedited study of potential stadium sites. And that task force was co-chaired by Count City Councilman Ed Ribka and uh, Carol Hoover, uh, then of the Growth Association. They reviewed probably a dozen sites scattered around downtown Cleveland over the course of March and April 1996. And for a variety of technical kind of, you know, egress, ingress, parking, other issues, narrowed it down to two potential sites, the lakefront site and the so-called North Norfolk Southern site, which is located uh, immediately south of Gateway. Uh, on further review of the Norfolk Southern site, it had some geotechnical issues. It, it kind of was like in a valley. So kind of the engineering that you would have to do to support the stadium got very, very cost prohibitive. So that committee ended up concluding that 
unanimously that the lakefront site was the site. But I will also tell you, having been in a dozen or more negotiating sessions with then um, number two NFL official Robert, Roger Goodell and his staff, that the NFL was committing $48 million to the cost of that stadium, and there was serious question of whether they would do that if we moved the location. Well, we also had a lawsuit that we were going to win, and they knew it. So that was the only reason they came back to the table, plus the fact that the new owner flew the old owner out to Baltimore with that team. So there's, there's some inside baseball with that. But that aside, uh, the stadium, bad spot. When that came down, the, the vista from, from the courthouse was frighteningly beautiful. And then to see that monstrosity put back up there is uh, on that footprint, which led to the horrible design, as you can remember, or maybe you don't, the windscreen craziness and everything else. So everything was done wrong and forced. In typical Cleveland, we bent over, and I thought we should have fought a little bit harder. So I wish you, I, I hope you will fight a little bit harder on this board. Uh, I would not include, and I think you answered well, that uh, it is a political football to put the football stadium on the gateway. I don't think it has any business being there. And it's got about a 10-year. You're going to 34. I, I would be surprised if we got to 30. So I would suggest that maybe at this time, maybe the gateway, gate, gateway board should be in discussions with Cleveland about a new stadium where it should properly be placed. And the cost of the land that's sitting over there could easily take a quarter of the, of the chunk out of building a new football stadium, preferably with a roof on it here in Northeast Ohio and away from the lake, which all indications are just destroys facilities, especially stadiums that we found out through all of our sitting here with experts telling us not to build on the lake because it, it's just such a difficult thing. And as far as costs uh, and geotechnical, I sat in a courthouse for I don't know how many years listening to those pylons being driven down for the new stadium, so I don't know what the cost of that was, but I, the geotechnical transfer of costs to that to what we had to put down there to put that facility on there, and, and it is sinking. Um, you know, it seems like uh, we should have looked a little bit harder. But again, I know the NFL had a pretty big hammer, and, 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 we, and we went that way. So I wish you uh, well on that. I always wondered about you know, whose call really it was and where that was going. And, and if $48 million won the day, then I guess, uh, I guess that's what we were stuck with, and we're paying the price, in my opinion, ever since. So I, I would hope that discussions are going to move forward now to be prepared in the future for a new stadium because it has to be done, unfortunately, I think. Thank you. Councilman Jones. Okay. Uh, Mr. Silliman, good afternoon. Uh, my question as a follow-up to Councilman Miller's. Um, I, I just remember back uh, on the stadium days in, back in the 80s when uh, Kevin Mack was running over folks in the middle of the snow. <laughs> And we were used to having our opponents come into a, a cold, you know, unfriendly environment. Um, I, I say that to say, uh, w knowing the history that you have, was there ever consideration around putting a dome on that? It certainly was not what we were used to, um, but a dome would have given us more than eight games a, a year. Um, and uh, is it a possibility now? What were the thoughts then and, and is it a possibility now? Through, through the chair to uh -huh. Councilman Jones, uh, there was consideration of putting a dome uh -huh. when the deal was first struck with the NFL in February of 1996. Uh, Mayor White brought in the leadership of the then Convention and Visitors Bureau, and he put that question to them. He said, if, if we end up uh, deciding to put a, a dome on our new stadium, how much additional tourism, how, how, what would it buy for the community? And the, that uh, entity looked at that question and they came back with, uh, yes, it would buy you some more events per year. 
it would put you in competition for getting a Super Bowl, but overall, it, it would not yield the dramatic um, increase in event days that you might otherwise think. Um, and uh, you can look at se several other examples. The, the St. Louis football stadium that's now been abandoned uh, had such a dome. And I think if you looked at the track record of that facility, it did not attract an extraordinary number of events. So um, ultimately, in the spring of 1996, um, the city of Cleveland concluded that you, you, it was really not cost effective to build a dome given the number of events you could get out of it at that time. Whether that's changed over the years and whether it's a different answer today, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, that, that was the answer back then. Was its inability to attract the necessary events based on its size or structure? The queue being small, it does attract. We, we use the queue in that way. Why would not have that facility? What was the rationale as to why they thought it would not attract? Um, I think they, they looked at the queue and the kind of events the queue, uh, at that time it was called Gundarina, but the kind of events that, uh, the, that Gundarina attracted, and there were just not enough events that were too big for Gundarina that would fit into a new dome stadium that would really uh, attract... Now, the other thing you have to uh, consider, uh, there are a lot of people who think, well, if we build a dome stadium, th then we get one or more Super Bowls. But put yourself in the position of an ESPN reporter or whatever. Um, you're covering a Super Bowl for a week, and if you're covering it in a city like Cleveland in February... Yeah, you, when you're there watching the Super Bowl, you're under a dome. But when you're going back and forth between your hotel and the facility, you're going in freezing weather, snowy weather, whatever. In other words, our climate is not ideal for attracting these huge events, you know, a Super Bowl, an NCAA Final Four, because a lot of the the decision making about where you put it has to do with what what your travel to and from your hotel look like. So that's another factor. Okay. Um, my, my last question uh, is: uh, I, I go back to the, the the challenges to the the Q project, and the, we're not all in, and all of those things that were said that we heard in the media. Um, I certainly was in. I was a, a, a strong supporter of it. Um, for me, I just looked at the facts. I said it's publicly owned. It belongs to the people. We're bonded. We're borrowing bond, bonded dollars, and we're repaying it with uh, bed tax dollars. People who come to our community that don't live in the community, and and those who ticket receipts, and it was a pro there was a profit made. It was profitable. That profit was going back into the city of Cleveland residents and to that so the facts didn't match up with the the rhetoric that was going on in the media. Um, I saw it as a win-win and a, a revenue maker for the residents of the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. Uh, but that story was just, that narrative was out there, city versus, you know, downtown versus the community. Um, my, my, my question is, uh, I, everything I said was rooted in the fact that that building belonged to the people, unlike many of these private-owned buildings here. The, the Brown Stadium and the, and the uh, baseball stadium, are they also publicly owned? Are these all identical? Is there any difference between the, the ownership structure of all three buildings, or are they identically, perfectly the same? Um, the, um, the, the Brown Stadium is owned by the city of Cleveland and leased until the year 2029 to the Browns. So it is a public facility in every sense of the word. Um, as far as the uh, ballpark and the arena, they're technically owned by the Gateway nonprofit entity, 
But since Gateway doesn't have a lot of resources, Gateway's recourse is to the city and county whenever funds are needed. So indirectly, both the ballpark and arena are public facilities as well. And yes, I, I think that was a very compelling reason to invest. And I'll, I'll, uh, one thing that did not get picked up in that debate was the compared to what question, which to me is very important. What are other cities doing? What are they spending on their facilities? And when you look at the Q deal, which was 70 million from the public and seven, 70 million from the team to, to extend an existing facility when other owners are bargaining for brand new half billion dollars. Like, you know, when I was sitting in the city council hearings and listening to the opponents of the Q deal, and they're touting Milwaukee as the great, great example of a community benefits agreement and all that. Well, yeah, you. <laughs> it's pretty easy as an owner to come up with some community be benefits when you get a $250 million check from the from the state of Wisconsin and the city of Milwaukee. And I never understand how they could use that argument, but, you know, they did. Mm -hmm. All right. Ken, my last last question. Uh, you certainly are very experienced in the inclusion areas with, with Mayor White and, and uh, Frank Jackson. Um, as you continue doing similar efforts in Gateway, um, will you also provide what I call a, a, a dash, people's dashboard of of goals and um, and outcomes where we can see what your goals were and, and what you accomplished in in terms of, of the MBEs and FBEs and your work with the unions and and, and with contractors. Um, a as a joint as a joint appointee, I consider myself uh, responsive to Mayor Jackson and the Cleveland City Council to um, uh, the county executive and the Cuyahoga County Council. And I know firsthand and from what I've heard today what your priorities are. And yes, my answer is yes. Uh, as your appointee, um, that is one of, the, one of the things I'm hearing and I'm not surprised to hear is a priority and, and therefore I work for you, so your priorities become my priorities. And uh, I believe the Gateway staff already does that. Um, and, uh, but uh, making sure that it's regularly available, um, dashboard or whatever, mm -hmm. yes, um, you yeah. can count on that. Right. And I say it in that way because I think over time, over years, when we're able to when, when I have in my hand that dashboard, simple, when I go into a community meeting and be able to share with the residents the actual outcomes and results of what's happening with their tax dollars, I think it starts to mitigate some of those, uh, that rhetoric. It can has the potential to mitigate some of that rhetoric when the time comes when, when the community is asked to do something, that they remember those things. And, and the, the better we can articulate it and communicate on a on a daily basis, just what they're getting for their dollars, I think it would have long-term benefit. Understood completely. All right. Well, if there are no further questions, comments, or concerns, um, I will make the motion to move this to the full body of the council, and I will make that motion <coughs> under second reading suspension. Do I have a second? Yes. It's been moved and second um, by Councilman Gallagher. If there are no further questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. Hi. All right. Thank you very much. I Thank appreciate you. your patience, your time, and your willingness to serve in this capacity. It was a pleasure having you before us today. Thank you. All right. Our final item as we come to a close and we're running over our time, which is very unusual for me. So this more than makes up for the time we've had short meetings. So if Mr. Buchane, if you'll please step forward and if you'll read the item into the record. Resolution number 2018-0117, adopting various changes to the Cuyahoga County non-bargaining classification plan. And I want to thank you for your patience. If you will share with us what you have before us today, sure. Mr. Buchane. It makes it a lot easier with Trevor agreeing to pay for parking tickets. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, still morning. Good afternoon. 
Um, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee, I'm Albert Bushaheen, Manager of Classification and Compensation for the Personnel Review Committee. Commission, my apologies. Before you, for your consideration, are modifications to the county's non-bargaining classification plan. The recommended revisions to the five classifications before you are routine maintenance and part of the effort to complete formatting changes to include percentages of time, FLSA status, and distinguishing characteristics. The recommendations do not include any changes to pay grade or FLSA status and therefore have no fiscal impact. All the modifications before you were prepared by the PRC class and comp staff, who's worked extensively with the Department of Human Resources and county management teams to ensure that they're fully award, informed of these recommendations before you. In accordance with the PRC rules, the proposed changes were posted on the PRC's website prior to their consideration and were approved at their May 16, 2018 meeting. Madam Chair, we're requesting that these recommendations be approved under second reading suspension of rules. Thank you for your consideration. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right. Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns from this committee? All right. Not on this one. All right. This seems pretty routine. And Mr. Councilman Miller, are you good? Uh, just going to make a motion for a second, second reading suspension for approval. I'll make the second. It's been moved and seconded. If there are no questions, comments, or concerns from this committee, all in favor, please say aye. 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 No opposed. This will move to the full committee thank of the council at um, the next meeting. And thank you again for your patience. Really appreciate it. All right. Um, I think we are, if there's no miscellaneous business, we are adjourned. All right.